Welcome everyone to the teaching and learning call for PERIO uh, at September 20th and I'm Tricia Gordon with the University of Virginia facilitating the call today. Glad to see you guys and uh, I think we have quite a few announcements. Uh, Neil has populated the agenda with quite a few things and so Neil I'm going to turn it over to you because I bet you're going to Yeah, tell us I just. All about it. Okay, I just copied and pasted from last time, so I'm going to trim it down here. There is a Sakai accessibility call today for those interested. That's at 4 p.m. Eastern um, in a pair and Big Blue Blatt in room four. Um, we already had the lightning talks. Those are posted to YouTube. That's the downside of copying and pasting. We still do need QA resources for the Sakai 12 effort. So, um, you know, if you're able to help with uh, QA planning or actually doing testing, please let us know. And we have a uh, uh, onboarding, um, where we're trying to make it easy for people to to get started with QA. Um, and uh, that related to that is that we have onboarding every week um, at 9.30 a.m. We'll do an orientation or answer questions uh, for people who are getting started on QA and then have our main uh, testing session at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, still need documentation uh, people for Sakai 12 updating the documentation. Uh, let's see. Seeing if uh, Wilma it's was. It's the on ride here. along this Friday. We had the ride along, and it's that's also recorded, and also I'll find that um, and and paste that in here. So we had the ride along, so we had a demo of, of what's involved in um, in doing updating Sakai online help documentation, and I'll I'll paste that in, and uh, it's really not that hard. So hopefully we'll find some people that can participate and help with that. And there's. Um, a reminder about the Sakai camp and Eventbrite registrations open. So if you're interested in that, that's available. Uh, that's in Orlando, Florida. That's a really uh, one of our premier events every year. We get about 20 people or so, and um, we have a lot of fun and we do a lot of planning. and And it moves a lot of the um, energy in the Sakai community and in the project along quite a bit, typically. So um, Sakai camp light coming up at Duke. Um, just like a one day to get together after those of some of us are attending the All Things Open conference in Raleigh and then maybe meeting informally there. And the big one is Sakai Virtual Conference and there's um, uh, a call for proposals that's open. So please think of uh, um, what kinds of proposals you can do for the Sakai Virtual Conference, uh, which is for Tuesday, November 14th. And also, something else about that. Um, seems like we could probably use um, uh, people to facilitate some of the sessions. So we have on, it's a completely online conference and it's uh, geared towards teaching and learning. So uh, one way you can help is by getting the word out at your institutions and letting your instructors and faculty know that this is something that is for them. Um, and no travel cost. And the other way you could help is considering facilitating some of those events. We'd like to divide up the moderation um, of those different pieces. So I think try to go there, through that pretty quickly. Um, Good job. Thank you. Do you know if uh, uh, Wilma is planning to send out anything to previous facilitators for the virtual conference, or we just reach out to her? If uh, go ahead and just reach out to her, but I'll mention I'll mention that to uh, to her. And for those who don't know, Wilma Hodges is um, the Sakai Virtual Conference Chair. And I was looking to see she's not on the call, or I would have had, would have had her just uh, give her pitch. And Dave, you posted in the chat that the virtual conference happens right before the OLC conference. Could you say what OLC means? Or could you type it in? Online Learning Consortium. Thank you. Right. And that's all online, right? That event. OLC is not online. Oh. <laughs> Funny. OK, it's at Disney. Cool. Well, 
Louisa wants to know if the OLC has virtual registration. And they do. Thanks, Dave and everybody. So we're going to go ahead and move on into, unless anybody else has any more announcements, uh, we're going to go ahead and move into our main speaker presentation with Denise Comer from Duke University, who's going to be sharing um, her Atlas winning um, experience, uh, the internship using social media and digital discourse. So Denise, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to you. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm delighted to be able to share more about the course. And I'm going to take you through the main ways that we're using Sakai and what the purpose of the course was. And then I'll open it up to questions. And I'm happy to answer any question. So I was very uh, happy to win the Atlas Award this year for Writing 270, which is a unique course that was launched four years ago at Duke University. And the course is that it's a summer on Sorry, and off for students who are in internships. Denise. Pardon me. You're yes. missing him just a little bit. I'm not sure why. So just be aware. And I missed most of what I this slide. OK, I'll start again. I'm, can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, so just interrupt me again if, if it breaks up again. Writing 270 was initiated four years ago as a, an online full credit course for Duke undergraduates who are engaging in internships or work experiences over the summer. And it is one of only a small handful of courses that are for credit for undergraduates right now at Duke University. And so it's unique in that respect. I think maybe there are three or four courses total out of all of our offerings that are online for undergraduates. We launched it four years ago, and the main uh, purpose was to offer students a chance to reflect meaningfully on their internships. Many internship employers are requiring credit for the internships, and what students had been doing is they would wait until they returned in the fall semester, and they would do an independent study with a faculty member. Uh, which often worked out fine, but it did put burden on faculty and students and during during the actual semester. And students also lost a fair amount of the currency for their internship because they had to wait a few months to reflect and um, maybe didn't capture as much as they might have. And so we decided to run a course that helped students learn about how to write in social media and digital contexts and reflect meaningfully on their internships and also offer them a chance to connect with peers while they were they would otherwise be kind of disconnected from their Duke peers. Over the course of the eight week uh, class, students write a blog post that's public only for the space of the class. We don't ask them to publish it more, more broadly. And they also uh, study a micro blog such as Twitter or Instagram that's relevant for, their, for the industry in which they're working. And they craft a digital story, which is a combination of video and audio and the way we're using it a combination of video and audio that asks them to narrate kind of their experience of how they ended up in this internship and what their story is and then they also have an opportunity to create um, a project of their own choosing and ask me anything project and i'll share more about that but the main objectives of the course are to write about their internships, to reflect on their internships, to discuss their internships, and to have that peer-to-peer -peer engagement. When we were conceiving of the course, 
we decided to run with some keystone concepts and these are listed here. So Sakai is the primary platform for the course and we integrate into Sakai, Google Hangouts and WordPress. For the Google Hangouts, we have once a week writing workshops. And so we could bring into the course, even though it's mostly asynchronous and online, we could bring into the course the foundation of writing courses, which is uh, peer review and interaction about writing. And so we have uh, group writing workshops once a week, as well as individual between the student and the faculty member. We also integrate WordPress with Sakai by having a menu button off of Sakai that links to the students' blogs that they're creating across the semester. We really focused on a connectivist approach. As I said earlier, the, the course hinges on students engaging with one another. So they create the content and then they discuss the content. And so we didn't want to be offering busy work for students where they would you know, post something and then only the faculty member would read it. And so all of the um, course tasks involve students creating knowledge together. So for example, they might um, look at someone's blog who's in a, a professional field relevant to their internship, and then they reflect on the forums in Sakai about that and include a link and pull out certain key quotes or elements of interest. And then go to that forum okay. breaking up a little, little sorry um and so i don't know if it might help if you wanted to call in oh sorry, i could i could do that how do i do that yeah, hold on i'm going to paste the phone number and pin into the chat so i actually i full screened my um my PowerPoint, and I don't know how to get out of full screen, so I can't see the chat right now. <laughs> you can use the escape key on your keyboard. Yeah, that doesn't work. I tried that. Oh, well, I do not know then. <laughs> okay, well, let's just keep going then. Or you could email me the phone number. Sure, I can do that. Hey, Denise, if you full screened your PowerPoint, do you see a small minimize icon on the top right corner of that window? It looks like a little minus sign. Yeah. If you go ahead and click that, that should minimize the PowerPoint, which will let you see the chat. Yes, I see the chat now. Okay, thank you. Oh, great. Thanks, Matt. Okay, I'll call in. Okay, go ahead and just... Um, turn off your computers or mute your speakers on your computer so you don't get feedback. Okay. And we'll be wait right here. Right. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Great. That's Thank better. you. And I'm out. Uh, that. That's okay. So now I've lost my visibility of the PowerPoint altogether, though. How do I get that back? Oh, it's probably sitting down in your taskbar. If you mouse over it, you should see it off on the right. And you can just click on it to open it again. Or can you see the browser with your PowerPoint in it? Okay, there, I got it. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so All should right. I start at the top of this um, slide again? When was I breaking up? 
Uh, probably uh, right in the middle. Okay. So um, the second part of the assignment would be then that students go on the forums and um, respond to what their peers have written and compare the blog reflections that the, their peers have done to what they have found too. And so there are a variety of different assignments like that across the term. The course lasts for eight weeks and we chose eight weeks because writers need a significant amount of time to write and reflect and revise. And we are now, as I said, in our fourth year and we run approximately three sections a semester, um, I mean a, a, a summer, with 15 students in each section and we have a team of faculty working with these students. So we have for each section an instructor and a teaching assistant, which enables really significant one-on-one -on -one feedback for the students. And so our um, design and development, this is a busy slide and it's busy on purpose because I wanted to recognize that a lot of people have contributed to the development of this course, namely the Duke Center for Instructional Technology. I consulted with Randy Riddle at the beginning of the, the adventure and uh, he helped me learn Sakai in ways that I hadn't ever learned teaching um, in face-to-face -face context. Each instructional team changes the course a little bit so that they can have a part in course design and make decisions about what, what they feel like is important for that summer. The core learning objectives stay the same and the core concept stays the same, but the assignments are shifted slightly every summer. And then we get significant feedback from the students as well, and we make shifts based on that. In my discipline of writing studies, we have had um, a long history of online writing instruction in a variety of contexts. And so as I was designing the course, I relied on my discipline's values, such as the um, position statement, which is from the Conference on College Composition and Communication. And um, some of the principles, these are available online, some of the principles included in that position statement include um, enabling, as I said, faculty to have autonomy in designing their own courses and to have students have the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one feedback from instructors and also engage in revision and peer review. So I'll take you through a few different screenshots of the course and so you can get a sense of what the course looks like. When students first join the course, most Duke students have not taken a Duke undergraduate course that is online and so we assume, as I said, because hardly any are offered for credit, um, they might have taken some in high school of course, but um, we assume that at this point we also need to coach students on how to be an effective online learner. And then we also want to recognize that this is often the first time that they're working full time. Some of them who are working in finance and banking are working 90 or 100 hours. And they're also taking out this course, which is a full credit course and, and has a lot of work to it. And so we, we help them um, make the course as um, navigable as possible. And then the first week, which I'll show you in a second, is also comprised of helping them really think about how they're going to kind of budget their time for their coursework and for, the, for their work and commuting. But when they first enter the course, they arrive at a landing page and we highlight um, where they're supposed to go. So we welcome them and then we have links set up. So that first line that's highlighted, if you haven't already done so, please visit forums checking in, which is just a way of asking them on the first day of the course to say, hey, I'm here <laughs> and, um, and I'm ready to go. And then um, we direct them immediately to the lessons page as well. And we provide a brief overview of the course on this page. The lessons are the main driver of the course. We reveal them one week at a time. So for the first week, the students would only see the week one lessons, but those are revealed every Monday at 9 a.m. And 
students have a series of deadlines. They have deadlines that are either on, uh, usually on a Thursday and then on the following Monday. So they can self-pace in between Monday and Thursday and Thursday and the next Monday, but they all have to produce certain things so that they can all be moving through the course together. And as I said, this first week, we really focus on building classroom community and having them get to know each other. So we have a lesson about sharing certain parts of who, who they are and where they are. And then we have a, a quiz in lesson two about how to be a successful online learner, um, which involves them actually staking out the times during the week based on their schedule when they plan to do their coursework. And we also focus early on on the ethics of blogging about others. And so we address matters of, um, of privileged information and some of the internship organizations require confidentiality statements and non, um, you know, not, not using social media. And so we address um, how they can still complete the course without um, breaking any of those rules. <laughs> so um, I'll give you an example of the lesson page. So once they click into a lesson page, this is the one about um, the ethics of blogging about others. We have the same, uh, we have consistent formatting across all lessons so that the first week they have to maybe kind of learn what the course looks like, but after that they will be very familiar with what the course looks like and so they won't have to search for where the deadline is. So always we have the same format where we have the title of the lesson, the deadline, the purpose, and um, we talk about what kind of, how it fits into their grade, and then the details, and then we also have an estimated time for completion so that each week they can know how many hours they're going to need for, for whichever component. And in this case, we had them watch a video about, this was about someone who had traveled internationally and was doing a, a, a student who had traveled internationally and was doing a service engagement project and writing a blog about it and wrote some things about their host family that were um, like poking fun at the host family in some way and then the host family like someone else saw the blog and forwarded it to the host family and of course that was offensive and insensitive and so <laughs> it's the lessons learned from that experience so that right away we can help students think about if they're writing about um, other people at their workplace or about um, their interactions with others that they need to be really cognizant of, even though in our space it's relatively private, you know, to the class that you can't ever know who's going to read something. And so it's best to just, you know, write things that, that are, that you're really happy with other people reading in, in the context of social media. So Denise, can mm -hmm. uh, back on that slide, you had something about the stakes and a thumbs mm -hmm. up, and we had a question wondering, could you level a little bit for us? Yeah, sure. What does so, the thumbs up mean? And yeah. <laughs> so on the syllabus page, we have um, a list of icons and describe what they each are. So I didn't screenshot that. So the students will know in the first week what, what that means. So they, um, we instituted a, a stakes level um, icon of thumbs up because of the, uh, you know, it seemed social media is, but students in the first year had been um, having a difficult time gauging what they should be really worried about in terms of mm. what were the major elements of the course and the minor elements. And so of course they complete everything, but we have a lot of like lower stakes assignments that are sort of like sequenced into and preparation for the larger assignments. And so in this case of ethics, this is a small assignment. They watch a video and then they post a reflection about the video on the uh, forum and then they engage with each other in that conversation a little bit. But in the scheme of the course, you know, there might be 80 assignments that are like this, right? And so we are using the thumbs up, the single thumbs up to designate to students that this is something that you need to do, but you don't need to really put all of your effort into, you know, you don't have to yeah. sit down and like co compose and revise. And then we have other things that are middle stakes. And then the major projects that I indicated are, you know, the um, three thumbs up, which is the highest level of stakes. Okay. Cool. Thank you for that. 
door. And feel free to interrupt me. I'm I'm on that large screen, so I won't see the chat yeah. questions. So just That's keep fine. interrupting yeah. as, as I Thank come. You. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And so um, we link through the lessons. We link to each element of the course that students are needing to engage with. And so the lesson about the um, ethics, I guess, would have linked to the discuss, analyze, and apply. It's a small world. And so this is an example of the forums. And we reveal the forums one week at a time as well. And this is all for the purpose, I guess, of not overwhelming students. <laughs> Because as I said, this like it's a long course for eight weeks, and there's a lot to it. But also so that they don't have to like search through and get lost. You know, which week are we in, and where are we? So only one week at a time is visible for students. And again, the reveal date is always the Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. We have a series of guided reflections. We renamed the quiz feature guided reflections because in my discipline quiz really isn't well in the way we're conceiving of the course it wasn't used as much certainly there are quizzes and writing courses but we weren't really quizzing students and we also didn't want the feel of quizzing um, because that felt a little bit counterintuitive to the community of writers that we were hoping to build where people would feel comfortable talking with each other and um, and sharing drafts and being vulnerable about their failures and misgivings about their career development and about their uh, performance at work. And so um, guided reflections seemed to be a, a little better of a, a concept for us. These also are revealed one week at a time and they're named by week. So the con this is all explained to students early on, but lesson one, two would be um, in week one, the second lesson. Lesson two, one would be from week two, the first lesson. And so these are often moments where we're inviting students to write about something that maybe uh, is a bit more personal and so is maybe more for the instructor communication rather than something they would want to reveal to their peers. So while we value peer engagement, we also recognize that sometimes students perform differently in front of peers than they do for instructors. And so, um, in this first lesson from the first week, that was the moment where they were talking about um, what strengths they have as a student and what they're in general, and then how they might apply those strengths to an online context and also with their um, self assessment of their weaknesses, and then as a student and how they might build on those in this course, and then naming certain times um, of the week where they will work on the course. And then for the citation one, that is actually like a um, actual quiz in week three where we have them uh, learning how to kind of translate academic citation practices to social media context. And so do you grade not questions or do you grade all of them? We we do grade all of them, yeah. Between it's the, the labor is divided between the instructor and the TA, and so we grade all of them and we give pretty intensive feedback. I would say that the instructor and TA engagement with the students is um, really heavy for the first maybe three weeks of the course, especially. Like everything the student does, one of us, the instructor or the TA, is responding because we want the students to be committed to the course. We were very worried that what can happen in online settings, as many of us know, is that students can become disengaged, right? Because they um, life gets in the way or they forget about the course, <laughs> and especially. Right. Like I said earlier, they're working 90, 100 hours, and they're not even around each other, and they're, it's, they have a lot on their plates. How many and students so, do you typically have in your course? It's 15 in each section, and so we run three sections. So how so many? 45. Three. Oh, that's about 45, yeah. 50 students. Yeah. We and then ran, we have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the nature of the views of rubric? Um, that the students follow to, um, to touch all the points that, you know, the outcomes that you're interested in, or or is it more free form? Or your voice broke up a little bit. A rubric for which parts? 
for the for the not only for the students to understand what elements to include and so forth, but also for you to use for feedback or mm. um, is it more free form? We, we design it neither, I'd say. It's a, um, a, a collaboratively designed set of choices that writers make. And so early on when we're reading other people's blogs, um, you know, that are out there in the world, we create a, a wiki that uh, names certain choices that writers have made. And we try not to set up criteria because criteria change and shift across time, but also across context. So what might be the right kind of thing to include in a blog in one, um, one context might be really um, atypical in another context. And so we have, um, you know, choice points, I guess. And then the purpose of the workshops is revision and feedback. And so, and the instructor is present in those. And so it's small group workshops where peers give one another feedback and the instructor gives feedback on drafts that are in progress. And so we oh, look at gosh. the criteria that we have collaboratively developed, not the criteria, sorry, the choice points. And we give feedback about those during the Google Hangout workshops, which are synchronous. And then the students revise. And in terms of assessing the final projects, um, a, at the end of the term, we assess their uh, overall blogs, but we don't have, again, we don't have a rubric for that. Um, I hire people to work with the course who are really experienced writing teachers. And um, I kind of would, I don't think it would work well to have a, a set of rubric in this case that would work across all three sections because different faculty, I wanted uh, faculty imprint to be part of the course. Yeah, right. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And so this is actually, it's a good segue. <laughs> this is an example of the, the wiki. Um, here we are using criteria. So I think this may be from, we changed it to choice point. That was one of the um, great, uh, contributions of one of the faculty members in the third year of the course because they said, well, you know, we really can't have criteria, but anyways, here, here's an example of things that the class together would have come up with and that we're thinking of during the, um, during or after the hangout, right? Um, about oh, that. Mm -hmm. And the wiki are um, ideas that students have gathered from what they've read out there, the models that they've looked at. We ask students for everything they do, they look at models, they find models either that they appreciate or models that maybe have elements that they want to stay away, steer clear of too. Cool. And we, we use the grade book and um, the thumbs up icons that, that we discussed earlier really arose because we wanted there to be uh, accountability for the students across the course. And so we make the grade book visible. But in doing that in the first year or two, there were there seems to be a lot of anxiety on the part of students about, you know, they would like check their grade book all the time, you know, for these like two point things. And so um, anyways, we instituted the stakes levels so they could they could kind of gauge what was more or less uh, significant, but we have items for here. You can see we have 81 items in this category, I guess, which are the kind of lower stakes things. And we provide uh, feedback on a pretty at a pretty fast pace because we want students to know that we're reading what they say. And if we waited two weeks to provide feedback, then they would feel like they didn't necessarily have to adhere to deadlines. Mm -hmm. And we have a question, um, Dave wants to know, do you group the high stakes items into a group in your grade book or a category mm -hmm. rather than, is that how you categorize your grade yeah. book? Oh, mm -hmm. okay. interesting. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then we also have created a variety of other, I guess they're not technically Sakai tools, some of them are. So the ones that are, are that um, we use the sign up feature in order to have students sign up for the workshops. So faculty who join this approach are willing to often have workshops in the evenings and on weekends because that's 
typically when students are available. And then we also have students who are at, across different time zones, sometimes 12 hours, 11 hours, sometimes three hours, you know, so we have to kind of have workshops. We can't just hold them during um, typical East Coast business hour times, um, but we set up times when we are going to be available and then students join, they indicate that they'll be in this small group workshop of four or this one-on-one -on -one workshop with the instructor, which is more like a conventional conference. These happen across every week of the course, except for not the, uh, we take one break, I guess, um, which typically is around July 4th. We give them a break from the workshops, but it's my favorite part of the course. I'll show you images of it in a minute. We, this past year, uh, all put our pictures up. We didn't know that we could do this as a Kai, but now we put our pictures up there um, because again, we wanted to help students kind of feel like they knew, they could know who we are. Uh, we don't require the students to do that with their Sakai um, frameworks, but we do. We, with the Q&A here, um, we have a forum that is devoted specifically to Q&A, and we tell students that if, if they have like a personal question about their grade, of course, they're going to email the instructor, but if they have a course-related a course -related question, like maybe um, there was an inconsistency in a deadline or in something or they can't find a link or um, they don't understand something, we ask them to post it to this Q&A forum rather than emailing the instructor individually. And that is so that we, we wanted to avoid having instructors teaching in a way that was all by email, right? Like answering the same three questions mm -hmm. from three different students. And our, we wanted our time and energy to be devoted to engaging productively and meaningfully with the student writing and with each other than, um, than with these questions. And so we have the questions posed there and then we answer in that public space. And so if a student has a question, they know they go to that Q&A forum first to see if anyone else has asked that question already. And that has actually really, um, saved a lot of what I think might otherwise be kind of um, unproductive energy on our part. Mm -hmm. This up here, we created a menu button using the, you know, how in lessons you can create um, high level menu items. We created a menu button called weekly deadlines at a glance and we unveil these each week to, um, we add to these each week. And so this was, we wanted a one stop place where students could see exactly what was due when, because in the lessons feature, um, they're not always chronological. So like lesson, you know, if we have five lessons for week one, it's not like students move through them chronologically because sometimes we might need to give students a week to complete one of the lessons. And so anyway, so we needed to have a, a different way of organizing it. And so this is what we came up with. And so the purple deadlines are for Thursdays and the green deadlines are for Mondays. We had one of our faculty, one of our TAs actually, um, a few years ago is in visual studies. And so they recommended adding a lot of color and different design. That was when we added the thumbs up too. Denise, do you have any um, issues? I know uh, for colorblind people, the red and the green might look the same. <laughs> have you had anybody come come to you and say they, they can't tell the difference color-wise? I mean, but no. they can see the dates, yeah. No, and that's why I thought purple and green would be okay, but if purple's on that same area as the red, then maybe we okay. can change that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And Dave wanted to know um, the menu button. Dave, I think it's a, a top-level lesson subpage to appear in the menu. But it is. Yeah. It okay. is. Mm -hmm. I can go back. Um, well, I don't know if I want to scroll through now. The um, yeah, the the I'll show you the main landing page again at the end, so you can see all the okay. menu buttons that are on the left. Okay. Oh, great. So this, this is a picture of the uh, Google Hangouts and the Google Hangouts. Um, we had we had less success with them this past year. I might actually switch to WebEx for next year. Um, WebEx kind of makes more sense in a professional environment anyways, um, you know, because it's used, I guess, in professional context. But originally, our idea for Google Hangouts was that we wanted it to have that kind of like um, – friendly feel to it and we liked Google Hangouts for that but sometimes the students have connectivity issues with Google Hangout but what we 
as you can see, which we could do in WebEx also, is that students join. We have, this is a small group. I think this one's me. And we, the students post their drafts there and we talk about them. And sometimes it's microblog posts and sometimes it's blog posts, but it's nice because you can have the student text there as well as the faces. And um, students really love these because, as I said, they, um, get to talk across disciplines and professional contexts, but they also are connecting with their, they miss Duke when they're away and they're feeling, you know, it's, a, it's internships yeah. are exciting, but they're also can be um, stress producing, I guess, because they're sort of reflect, realizing how little time they have before they're actually responsible for, you know, supporting themselves in a job of some mm -hmm. kind. And this is, we have a question mm -hmm. about um, art. Do you, list webcams and mics as requirements for the course to participate in these uh, online sessions? Yeah. yeah, on the syllabus we have a section that talks about what kinds of um, technologies they're going to need and also what kinds of technological knowledge they're expected to have, which actually is nothing. We are happy to coach them through that, but we have a section that's specifically about that. Mm -hmm. And the um, this is the Sakai the WordPress button. So they from again from the main menu level, which I'll show you again at the end. We we created a link that's a main menu button on our Sakai page that links to this WordPress collection. And this is the main collection. And then each student creates a subsite for their ongoing blog across the course. You may not know the answer to this, Denise, and that's fine. I'm, I, someone asked earlier, and I'm curious as well, do you have any idea how WordPress is integrated into your Sakai instance? Do you know um, anything about that? You might have to ask Jolie. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the, the only answers I can provide are that, again, I create, from the lessons, I create a main menu button so that it's a, or maybe I don't do that. Maybe it's a link. Uh, maybe I add a link and it's a main menu button. And so when you click on that button, it brings you to WordPress. You but yeah. through our, um, like our student information systems, all of the, um, when the student is registered for a section, they're in the Sakai and then they're also in WordPress. And as an instructor, I can choose like from, I don't know, a bunch of different um, class technology options for every course and they're all kind of integrated mm -hmm. together. And like WordPress is one of them in the list yeah. that you can add yeah. to your site. Okay, got it. Yep. Got it. Okay. And I just have this slide, and I think that this is the final one, but um, the, this is just an example of the student um, project that they create. Um, the final project, again, is sort of like they get to decide what format they want and what they want to do, and they're um, super creative. So we get people doing podcasts about uh, an issue in their industry or profession um, they do infographics they talk more generally some of the students who have confidentiality clauses might actually not reflect um, on specifics of their internship they might talk instead about um, general professional development kinds of issues right or the city you know um, experiences commuting or um, I don't know dressing professionally or learning how to network with others so they have a lot of flexibility with what they can um, can do and this was a, a blog that someone actually was doing for her internship as well. It was like a more public blog that she needed to do. And then this is an example of this digital story. And this is questions, but let me scroll back through and I'll return to the main menu button, main landing page. There we go. Okay, so here's the weekly deadlines at a glance button. Of course, what's showing is the start here welcome page, but, um, uh -huh. and then the, that's the 270 WordPress blog. Okay. And you can, yeah, I think the only thing that's not visible here is the sign up, which might be below the wiki. Okay. This so I'm happy to <laughs> really great. I'm, I'm really impressed with all the tools that you're incorporating in your course and um, using with such success. Are there have you come across any gotchas with any of the features in Sakai that um, 
that you had to abandon possibly or that you tried and, and didn't work as well as you had hoped? Let me think. Occasionally, no, I haven't, I haven't had to abandon anything. I have found everything to be pretty, um, pretty, once I figure it out, pretty manageable for students and, and the faculty. Occasionally with the signups, students think they've signed up and then they haven't. Um, that happens a couple times each summer. And so that's one thing. And then the grade book, I will say, is because we have so many items in it, it loads really slowly. And I oh. don't find the navigation of the grade book to be very easy from an instructor standpoint. Like I have to scroll through a lot in order to get to where I want to go. So that might just be because I'm not sure how to navigate it myself. But that's one piece that that feels a little cumbersome from the instructor side of things. Um, Sometimes. Interesting. That's good feedback, too. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of other questions. The, um, Neil wants to know, how did students find the process of reflection? Did they feel supported in their willingness to open up? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk, we get to know them through the Google, through the um, synchronous workshops, and so we have a chance to talk and communicate. and. Everybody, of course, is always a little um, nervous to be vulnerable <laughs> and <laughs> share things at first. But across the semester, um, they get they get much more um, honest with each other, I guess. Because also we encourage a lot of, um, you know, we ask questions in a way that invites them to to think about how they might do things differently and um, right. Uh, I'd say they're all lucky students. This looks like a great course. Um, one, one more question I have is, um, I assume that you duplicate last summer's course site to create this summer's site uh, or sites. Mm -hmm. uh, is that how you go about it? So that yeah. you just have to go in and update the dates, the availability dates of like the lessons pages that are hidden in and the forums and so forth. That's exactly right. So we have to update. I have a an email. So I, I lead the instructional team every summer. It's not the same people because in where I work, um, you know, people do different things, I guess, and they're not always available consistently. Sometimes I've had one co-instructor the same um, across the four years, which has been great. <laughs> um, actually, two have stayed the same. Um, but yeah, I, I have an email that guides them through exactly what changes we need to make as we update. So we import okay. the materials to one site and we have to change, as you said, the, the availability dates on the quizzes, the guided reflections and also the lessons. But um, also, as you can see here, there's a lot of text within the boxes that oh, needs yeah. to be changed. And, right. and every year I think to myself, let me try to make this more generic, you know, so I don't have to do so much work every summer. But right. it's really important for the deadlines to be in multiple places yes. all the time because otherwise students don't see them. Um, so we, ha we keep that. And then the other thing we have to update every year is the links. So right now this link to the forum checking in forum is specific to this site. But when I import for the next year, it's actually going to still be linking to the 2017 forum, and so I have to update mm. the link to the 2018 mm -hmm. forum, and that um, is so that migration while it, doesn't happen. Yeah. It doesn't, and while it's time consuming, it's actually really productive for the new people who are new to the course because that level of kind of um, it's really kind of like tedious, frankly, to make all those changes, but they they get to understand the course <laughs> in a right. way, you know, by doing all that it work. So happen. it's right. Yeah, it's okay. That's 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 an interesting uh, point about that. Um, so that's really something. Um, let's see. Dave wants to know how long did it take you to develop this course in weeks, I guess, or hmm. that's a good question. Um, I never know how to quantify course design and development because um, like if you're actually talking about like hands on, you know, like designing the Sakai site, um, even that is hard. Like I, I think I worked with 
Randy Riddle. Um, I I had already. This is not helpful in my answer. Um, I'll give a quick answer. I think it took um, maybe two to three months, I guess, of work. But you know, I was doing many other things, so I'd work on it a little bit at a time. So I don't know how many hours that was. But I had met with Randy maybe twice over that period because I had designed a MOOC um, one or two years before that. And so I was already learning a lot about online course development and like with small things like with the um, having a start here page and um, responding a lot in the first couple of weeks, especially and having the Q&A forum instead of the email questions, like those kinds of things I was already learning and the weekly deadlines, um, you know, self-paced, I guess, weekly deadlines. So that stuff was already partly what I knew. But as I said, like, we're still like adding to the course, even every year when we teach it, uh -huh. like the um, weekly deadlines at a glance wasn't there two years ago. So it's, it's kind of um, evolving over the years. Evolving, right. right. This, but uh, I did, what a great I did have experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. And um, you've given us all some really great ideas for how to design other courses where we are and um, also good feedback on some of the tools and their shortcomings. So, so we've got some conversations going on in the chat about some of that. Um, okay. But uh, uh, we're very grateful for you taking the time to share this with us. And congratulations okay. on winning the Atlas Award for this. This is, this is definitely um, a wonderful course, and your students are very lucky. Thank you so much. I appreciate the chance to talk about it, and I feel lucky every summer working with the students. And really, the um, Sakai I find to be a, um, a, a really valuable asset in teaching, and I was really excited to be able to discover all of these tools as I've been designing this course, Wonderful. too, and I use them in face-to-face -face teaching. So thank great. you all. Thank you. Okay. We're going to uh, just... Yeah, we're going to wrap up here um, with some future meeting topics and openings. And a lot of people are sending you their thanks in the chat, Denise. Um, so we have our next meeting is on October 4th, which we do not have a speaker. So it's open for suggestions and volunteers. And we have, go ahead, Neil. We can always do a Jirapalooza. <laughs> you can always threaten that again. <laughs> yeah, I actually think that we probably should do that on a regular basis, um, in my opinion. It well, seems like I was interested in that, but, but that could also be an off week that's not a regularly scheduled, um, uh, you know, teaching and learning meeting, so. Well, I'm just going to write Jira Palooza in parentheses beside it, so if, if we don't get any other um, good suggestions there, we can... We can just do that. Yeah, I'm thinking it really should be like a once a month thing or a once every other month thing so that we have some momentum and keep kind of chipping away mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. at things. Um. <laughs> Josh wants to know what happens in a Jira Palooza. It, it's an experience, man. You, you can't, nobody can really tell you until you experience it. You have it. to be there. <laughs> That's right. Josh. You got to be there. Um, and Luis is suggesting a specific tool to focus on. Uh, lessons or grade book I don't know so or so Sam ago oh I'll have to get Tiffany involved if we do that um, there is actually a, a, a Sam I'm sorry to interrupt there is a Sam ago weekly you know Jira review that happens on Fridays so I think we have that pretty well covered and yeah. Tiffany leads that so that's right I know um, Mark says he would love to have a discussion about 11 plus resources and the loss of the ad feature. I don't even know what you're talking about, Mark. Do you have a microphone? Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yeah, so we, we um, just did a bit, of an up, well, a bit of an update. We just updated to 11 um, and we did not anticipate that uh, what was previously available in 10 and below within the resources tool, um, there was an ad button that was relatively wow. intuitive to new users. Uh, now the steps to adding a new item to um, a folder or just on the surface of the resources tool is actually available within the actions menu. Um, 
that is only available within the principal folder that most folks don't understand why it's present anyway. Um, but uh, so we find that there's a bit of a trap with new faculty in particular. They uh, approach the they approach this process through the transfer files um, area, which is actually um, a web DAV uh, option that um, I, I don't think new users who just want to upload a syllabus should be using um, mainly for the time investment. So anyway, uh, boiling just back to what, uh, what I said in chat, um, uh, 11 and down has um, it within the resources tool, an add button that is very obvious for folks that's a step to take to add something, but 11 plus uh, Sakai does not. Uh, the add uh, upload file or create folders is baked into the actions menu. Um, so it's not immediately obvious to new users. Right, gotcha. Yeah, um, it's, it's been a pretty significant issue for us this fall um, as the new maybe, uh, version of Sakai yeah. was introduced. Maybe, uh we could have a, uh, one of these sessions focused around things like that, things that changed that weren't necessarily good changes or or perceived good changes. Because um, I'm sure, like the grade book, like um, Denise was just giving us feedback about the you know, scrolling issues with grade book and getting to her items. That's another one that, um, changed from with the new gradebook tool um, so we might we might actually um, get some good feedback of things to look at in future releases of Sakai uh, and so and forums yeah so um, Neil is suggesting that we focus on the teaching and learning JIRAs that Bye, Josh. Thank you. Uh, that we have tagged in Jira, so that's probably where we will go for the Jira Palooza, and um, then on October 18th, we've got Joe Lee and Sean Foster talking about creating an interface guide for Sakai. That work that was done through over the summer, and we have November 1st open. And November 15th is the day after the Sakai Virtual Conference, so we may want to think about whether we want to cancel that in lieu of the virtual conference, um, but we have time to talk about that. It is 10.59, folks, and I appreciate you hanging on and um, for your good input on the session and ideas for future topics. So we're going to go ahead and adjourn if there are no other burning questions or comments. 11 o'clock. Thank you all. Talk soon.